not with the person, but with the research product that person has generated. You can communicate with Socrates. Now, irrespective of the fact that he is not among us as a living entity anymore, but you communicate with Socrates, you communicate with Aristotle through the medium of a research product. That's how we as researchers, you and I, we talk. But there is a language for us. There is a specific format that you need to follow to be able to relate to the other researchers to be able to navigate and communicate within the broader research portfolio and the body of knowledge. We call it the body of knowledge. And this is your tool for navigation, that particular format of producing the writing. So why do you need to understand the format of a research report, what about the actual name of that report, a thesis, a dissertation, a tutorial, a thumb paper, a journal article, whatever. You follow a particular language, a pattern. That's the reason we are here today. We all know about this. There's nothing rocket science about it. Most of us are doing it on a day-to-day -day basis. You do it, I do it. Two points get right up front, all of us. Number one, I'm not here to give a profound lecture of about research methodology. I'm here to give you some very practical tips, which I found useful. So one researcher sharing very modestly some ideas, some tips, some practical insights, which I found useful and thought my fellow brothers and sisters struggling in the same domain called research may find them useful. This is this whole discussion that we'll have in the next one hour, whatever the time is, will be at a basic level. We are not trying or gorging anybody's level of knowledge. I am as a researcher, just this much. So I don't dare to talk about big things. I talk about things which I found useful on a day-to-day -day practicing level when doing research, when writing about it. And I just thought very frankly that this might be useful for some of us. Most of you may be already knowing it. And I say, that's excellent. You also share some of your ideas. Let's have a discussion together. So this is a discussion at a very basic level about one practicing researcher to another practicing researcher sharing some tips and practical insights. That's it. That's the purpose today. So we've got just about, let's say, one hour, 15 minutes. I'm not very worried about time. I can leave all the materials to you. And with, with a bit of a general discussion, with your level of maturity, for most of you, this is just common sense. When the university and your department asks me very kindly, kind of them, to think of a seminar topic 
I actually propose this. Rather than talking about something far, far flung, I thought this will be something hopefully useful for you and for me. You teach me something, you share your ideas, I teach you something, I share my ideas. That's it. That's the plan for today. Now, move on. We can use some, anyone with a bit of a concrete question, please use the chat box. Okay, so that we can get back. Let's say we'll have, after every 15, 20 minutes, we'll take some questions. And please don't ever assume that I have all the answers. You can ask all sorts of questions and be prepared to answer yourself. Move on. Now, the other point I wanted to make, when I say this, tips, let me see if I can get a broader um, highlighter. Okay, so the tips. Tips are essentially okay, personal. So these are my tips to you. Some might find it useful, as I said. Some may not find it useful. You might have a difference of opinion about it. I say salute. You follow your suit. Finish. So these are just some ideas to share, which I found useful. So I'm not at all suggesting that these are to be taken in total, okay, and duplicated in your exercise. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying these are some ideas, okay. You might contextualize, you might try them in, out, up to you. Move on. First point, three big parts in the report. The sections and subsections do not have to be exactly the same titles as used here. Okay, we can we can make, for example, if you don't use the term introduction and say background, or say setting the scene, okay, or the context, that's okay. As long as you have the basic materials covered, which are supposed to be in the introduction, finish. So don't get bogged down on terms too much. We just need to remember at this point that we have three broad chunks of, if you like, divisions in a typical research report, whatever the output is, or whatever the exact format is. You can think about it. In the article, for example, in a journal article, you might have to organize in a slightly different pattern, but broadly these contents, these elements, will have to be there in one name or the other. That's the point. So about title. Three tips about title. One, two, three, three tips. Do not make titles long and obscure. When I say long, Consult with your supervisors. I tell my PhDs, my friends, not more than 12 to 15 words. 12 to 15 words. It will also slightly vary between one discipline to the other. But in our kind of broad social sciences, okay, that's my tips. 12 to 15 words. No more. When I say obscure, don't make your titles too flashy, too poetic. If you want to try your creative skills in writing points, try it somewhere else not in your report. I have seen a report the other day, and all of us have to do it. Friends present here, I'm sure majority of you in one or the other are used to receiving 
review request okay, from different journals, etc., universities, etc. Most of you are aware of it. So in one of these articles, it's actually a review, a book review. The title was Life Isn't Ours. Life is not. Life isn't ours. And that's it. That's fine as a title of a literary piece of work. That is not fine as an academic research output title because it makes no sense. Don't try your reader's patience. Tip number two. So what do you do? What I find useful is that I go open up my research objectives and questions. I go back to the research objectives and questions and try to underline the main words, the key words, if you like, in your research objective. The main words, the main emphasis, the main, if you like, thematic focus in your objectives. So let's say I've got three research objectives. Identify one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight words from the objective Take them out, put them in a separate piece of paper, and then try to make a title out of them. That's my tips. And I found it useful. Why? That way, you do not miss. There is no way you will miss out on the core idea of your thesis, of your research. So in other words, your title will reflect your main message. I've given you three tips. Short, 12 to 15. Don't make titles obscure. straight, to the point, precise. Number three, your title must reflect your research. The main theme, the main message. One way to do it, there may be many other ways of doing it. I do it and my students do it in this manner. We try to go back to the objectives and then try to identify the key words from the objectives, okay? And then we put them together as a title. We find this useful. One common question that I face is that, is the subtitle possible or good? The answer is yes, okay. The subtitle is okay, okay? Only if you find this useful in the sense of highlighting. Just like when you are putting a camera on, you know, the manual camera, of course, okay? And then you try to fix the focus from a blurred vision to sharpen focus. If you think your second title, the subtitle, is serving that purpose, what purpose? Focusing. It further helps you to focus 
on your main theme, then the subtitle is okay. Inequality and urbanization in Dhaka or Kuala Lumpur. Subtitle, put a color and a subtitle. A focus on Selected slums. Okay, accept it. Inequality and urbanization in Dhaka. Hello. An ethnology of 50 street vendors. Okay, accept it. So, the purpose of a second level with the subtitle in your title is to further sharpen the focus. If it is not for that, don't use a second title. Finish. Move on. Table of contents, you need it. I put it not always required because I'm following this the University of Massey uh, pattern. So, don't, don't bother because they do it. Electronically, automatically. So you have to do your table of contents. Now, why do you need a table of contents? We do it kind of as a routine practice. This is the table of contents itself. That that itself is a table of contents. With the, the slide that you are now seeing. So why do you why do you need a table of contents? The idea of a table of contents is articulation. A R T I C U L A T I O N. If your table of contents is so confusing that it does not help your reader to articulate how the flow of logic is progressing in this thesis, then the whole purpose of production of a table of contents, writing up a table of contents is defeated. A table of contents is meant to give your reader a clear sense of direction in which your main arguments are flowing through your thesis, through your report. So table of contents must be showing a clear flow running across your research. If table of contents does not serve that purpose, if it makes it further, your reader further confused, then you better work out the table of contents again. So we don't have much time to get into details of it. I'm also keeping an eye on the watch. Okay, so um, unfortunately I cannot, even if we have got all the goodwill and even if we um, have time, I've got a problem to that, got series of meetings. So let's see, uh, let's see how far we can go. Okay, so move on then. Abstract. Remember two things about abstract. Right up front, remember this solid. You must write the abstract in a manner that it becomes a standalone piece. Meaning, even if a person does not go to your full report. Even if he or she completely ignores your main body, which is this, the main body, he 
or she should be able to get a reasonable idea about your whole report, whole work. So, first one. Abstracts must be self-contained. Self-contained. You must have enough in the abstract so that it gives the reader a reasonable overview of the whole work without having to read the whole thesis or report. Number two. This precisely happens in majority of the cases. People do not read your full length work. They actually just refer to the abstract. Okay. And in terms of dissemination and outreach, publishing business is a multi-million dollar business now, as you know. And it is a business, my friend. Okay. We are willy-nilly a party to it, but it is a business. As authors, as researchers, we may not make much of it. But we are having to deal with a very mechanized process of publication. It's not about whether I like it or not. Frankly, I hate it. But I'm a part of it. So remember that abstracts are the most important unit from a publisher's point of view, the most important unit. It's like the nucleus from a publisher's point of view, okay, for communication and outreach purposes. So, I bet two points about that, sir. And I hope some of my friends are taking a note of it. Because I'm going to ask you in a, in a minute, because I'm, I'm going to forget, that's for sure. With aging set in, I tend to forget things, obviously. And I'm happy with that. It's not a problem. You don't have to remember everything in the world. So I'm giving you some tips, and I want you to remind me when we do a bit of a recap towards the end. Okay, what did we discuss? So on abstract, I said, why abstract is important? I said two reasons. First point I say, this is the only part people will read in most cases, majority of the cases, in overwhelming majority of the cases, to be frank. Write it in a self-contained manner. So I'm going to give you some tips in, in, in a minute now, okay, about what I mean by self-contained manner. And number two, especially from the publisher's point of view, this is the core. They love it. So it is important to put sufficient time and energy in producing their stuff. A common mistake that we do, research is always cumbersome, my friend. It is a difficult thing to do. Even when people produce literally dozens of publications, okay, it becomes almost a second nature to them. I have met a number of good friends okay, who have actually published more than 100 articles. Some of your teachers okay, have actually done that. And I, I feel so proud about them, about my colleagues in your department and, 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 and other parts of the UN. I've, some communication with the air on a long-term basis. 
the point is, it is still painful. You never get used to it. There's no ease about production of a high quality research work. You are always exhausted. Even when you are producing your 150th article, you are still struggling. So that common kind of perception that we experience with prolification, okay, comes ease, doesn't apply for researchers. I don't know about my friends, you know, here, I get rejected. Okay, at least let's say twice every year. It blunt, uncivilized, arrogant rejections. So when I see it in other journals, okay. Sometimes I feel tempted, let me try to do a bit of a sweet revenge, which I try to control myself at that point. I get tempted to do that. So the point is very simple. Abstracts are produced with serious thought and hard labor. I tell my friends, at least five things should go in the abstract. Five. Five points should go in the abstract. One. Obviously. What is your research about and why is it important? So put differently, this is your research problem. Okay, and a bit of justification. A bit of justification. Remember, it will vary. Most journals, for example, they won't allow you more than 200 words. Some would allow you up to 250, in some very exceptional cases, 300. Universities also have their own pattern. I can't remember, the, I've actually seen a number of University of Malaya theses from different departments, but I can't remember you know, what was the exact size. So let's say Masai, they have page so 11 font and they've got the, some details of the margins which i cannot remember three page so i would say just kind of my rough estimate would be about 800 words it depends so you need to check with the journal check with your university what about the exact format of your report? The limits of abstract. Five things should go in the abstract. I say number one. What is your research about and why is it important? Put differently the research topic, the research problem, okay? With just a bit of the significance part. Finish, number one. Number two, methodology. Okay, methodology. Now, it is an abstract. Nobody is expecting you to give all the details of methodology. It's just not possible. You basically mention the methods that you've used. Okay, and if you have corresponding tools, you can also mention them. Tools are actually instruments. So let's say interview 
and there are many different types of interview. You have to be very precise. Okay? You are not a journalist. You are not a politician. When you are a researcher, it's not enough just to say interview. You have to say what kind of interview. So, that's your method. Interview is a method. The interviewing schedule or checklist is the instrument. Okay, this is an example. So, so what kind of methods have you used? Just mention them. In this research, the main methods of empirical data collection included blah 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 another line of a bit of details for example just a bit on for example 42 interviews were conducted covering a b and c in three sub districts of Malaysia. And then another one to two lines about why have you chosen these methods? What was your justification? Look, my friends, when you, let me just get a uh, grab a glass of water. Okay. Um, The problem with uh, Google Meet is that I'm not very used to this. So I cannot find most of the... Uh... Okay, so. Okay. Let's see. Um, abstract. Number one. As I said, done. Number two, done. Methods. Methodology. Just one last bit about methodology. Remember the term methodology has got two clearly discernible parts methods logos methodology methods logos l-o-g-o-s logos methods are the methods as you said so methods tools instruments that's methods you can also start a bit at the higher end, okay, where, where you talk about the philosophy of methods. Okay. And that's what we'll say epistemology. And I've actually seen that you've got a course on the philosophy of research, which is excellent. So, that's one part. Logos means the science of choosing the methods methodology the science of choosing the methods the justification the rationale of choosing the methods selecting the methods so you say methodology methods i've chosen interview i've chosen simple unstructured interview targeting blah 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 in blah 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 finish I have also made simple, uncontrolled observation. These are methods. And then the logos part, okay, you say, why have you chosen these particular methods? Maybe just a line, two lines, three lines, finish. No. That's methodology. The science of choosing the methods, methods and logos, two parts. Move on. I've done number two, number three. Major findings. Major findings. Now, selected. Nobody is expecting that you'll be able to put all your findings in an abstract. Nobody. See, here, you have to be selective. 
you have to prioritize. Some of your findings you try to highlight. This is the place you showcase the findings, not the whole law. Showcase. Showcase. Now, the next question, of course, is how do you make that selection? How do you showcase okay, the more important ones? How do you know that these are more important? Well, it depends on you. It depends on you and your supervisor. Talk to your supervisor. Have a discussion. You don't have to agree with everything that the supervisor says. Have a discussion. The whole point of having a supervisor is that he is your devil's advocate. He is on your side. He is your friend, but acting like an enemy. That is the purpose of a supervisor. So he's going to challenge you or she's going to challenge you. That's the whole purpose of her. She's ultimately or he's ultimately your friend. But all through the process, she or she is teasing you as an enemy so that you prepare yourself to face the art questions. That is the beauty of the beast of the supervisor's role. Move on. Okay, um, we don't have much time. Let's, uh, let's see. Oh, okay, so let's see. Number two, I say, number three, about how to choose your more important findings. Now, um, one way to do it, that's what I do. Again, you have, you have to find your own way of doing it. It's just my style. And it's not perfect. Again, I go back to my objectives, to my questions. Huh? And try to see which findings are most obvious which findings are immediately relevant for the purpose of answering my research objectives and questions i try to get at least those findings so let's say i've got three objectives okay remember always remember this every objective every research question that you have in your first chapter, in your thesis, in your report, whatever, is a commitment that you are making to the reader. You are telling your reader, look, my friend, if you go through my thesis, you will find an answer to my research question or objective. This is a commitment you are making. So in the conclusion, you must go back to your objectives and then answer those questions for the reader. So one way to prioritize your findings is to go back to the objectives okay, and then see at least we can choose those findings that help to answer your objectives. That's one technique that I found very useful. Number four, recommendations, recommendations. Now, again, selective, you cannot recommend everything. And I'll talk about recommendation, you know, in a minute. Again, selective. So, if you are following that argument that these are my objectives and here are some of the findings that will answer my objectives for my research question, then the recommendation can kind of logically follow suit. Okay, so you also pick and choose selectively only those recommendations that can actually relate to your findings. That's one way of doing it. That's number four. 
number five is a conclusion. A conclusion, you can do it two ways. I'm going to give you some details, you know, in the main body. Just give me more. Um, that's for abstract. It's basically a way of summarizing your main argument. That one last line, last two lines, summarizing the main argument of your whole research exercise. What is the core message? One message, one take away message that has come out of your research. And you want to let the world know, look world, this is what I've got. That's completely. Okay, so I'm doing a five items that should go in an abstract that way you make your abstract complete self-contained even if people do not read the main body they make a sense of at least a reasonable sense of what your thesis or report is about finish let's move on I'm going to skip the body for a minute because I'm going to come back. So let's from one, let's move on to three. Okay, let's let's move on to three. Let me just try to, I can't find the, uh, um, I can't seem to find the, um, okay, uh, no, I've, I've got it now. Good. So, um, I was not finding the chat box. So, if you have a question, then do leave it in the chat box. Please. please. Hi, Prokniyas. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. All right. Uh, this is Sonia here. Um, actually, you don't need to. I can read the questions out um, to you when you're ready to take questions. Okay. Uh, so well, you don't have to worry too much about the chat box. I'm compiling them. Oh, that's fine. Okay. That, uh, thank you, Raksanya. That's very kind. Okay. Um, right. But anyway, I just need to, in any case, see that people are still alive. Yes, yes. Sure. That's the whole point. So it's good to see the faces. Good. Okay. Uh, Mo. So we go back. And um, before the body, the main kind of discussion that we have, whatever time we have now, I just quickly want to ensure that I cover the, the supplementary material discussion. Okay? The, the third part. Now, supplementary basically would mean in practical sense. Any material, of course, reference you need. Reference is Especially now, this overwhelming and for a very good reason, the emphasis on plagiarism has made referencing and bibliography, especially bibliography referencing, particularly important. This is always important, has always been, but now it has assumed a new height of importance. So make sure that referencing is full. Okay. Plagiarism is a criminal offense by itself in academic world. If you are not writing a good report, if your expression isn't that good, if your English is problematic like me, okay, every possibility that you actually get a generous treatment. You might be overlooked or you might be kind of, you know, brushed up and passed on. But if there is an element of pleasureism, basically means that you or me, whoever has done it, I've done it. So I am a sophisticated criminal. That's what I am. I am a criminal. Finish. That's what it means. So you are putting yourself in a very different identity. 
there is no scope of generosity or complacence or soft treatment because you don't do it with the criminal. So much. No. Reference bibliography, make sure that's fully done. There is no harm in acknowledging other people's work. No harm. Nobody is taking your credit away. If you say that this is not me, this is Professor X, this is Dr. Y, it doesn't make you any smaller. So just acknowledge people's contribution. Okay. And move on with your work. Finish. That's it. Why should that be so difficult? In supplementary point reference, although they call it a supplementary point, okay, it is actually core. You have to do it. There's no escape. The other supplementary material is the rule to follow is very simple. Any material which is not so important that you have to put it in the main body. Again, supplementary indicator. Any material, the photograph that you have got, the okay, literature that you have got, any information that you have got, huh? a historical map that you have got, any material which you think is important to make your argument for the purpose of your thesis, but it's not so important. In other words, it's not important enough to take a place in the main body and thereby taking your precious space. But still, you don't want to leave it all together. So you want to relegate this to the appendix. That's supplemental. So you have to choose what to go in there. Now, one or two quick points. I tell my PhDs, if you have a historical material, not easily available, okay? Put back in. If you have an archival material, okay, use the sample, okay, in the main body, and the length, the lengthy discussion, put it in the appendix. Of course, if this is easily available, available, let's say, in a public domain, then of course you don't do it. There's no point in putting, for example, the map of Malaysia, okay, in the appendix. Okay, because map of Malaysia is everywhere. You get it here. Okay? You get it here. In a split of second, you get it here. So there's no point in putting materials just to make your report look. Don't do that. Don't do that. So archival material, not easily available, has historical value, yes. Some photograph, let's say photograph of your field work, yes. But then don't overdo. Many of us, okay, have very little sense. Okay, when we are absorbed in our work, okay, we lose sense of, if you like, common sense, sense of proportion. I have seen 36 photograph of field work, including selfies. Do not one, at best two, just to make a point about uh, or give an impression to the reader about the field work that you have done. Okay. Yeah. A good observation. An observation from the field which corroborates your discussion. Yes, moving. 
So I think I've said enough about supplementary material. Let's move on to the main body, the main body of the text. So, main body. Let's begin bottom up. Conclusion. I said when I talked about abstract, I said conclusion can have two things. I mentioned about one already. Conclusion is a summary. Huh? No. But it's slightly more than recapitulation. Summary, not in the sense of just recapitulating the whole thesis. That you can do. If it's a PhD, okay, you can actually have a kind of a section on recapitulation, which is okay. That's, that really helps in the sense of that will help you to also write down your abstract at the end. So if you write a good conclusion, you are actually writing a basic draft of your abstract. You can draw part of it into the abstract. Carve out. So first is recapitulation. But it's slightly more than that. In the conclusion, once you recapitulate, that the whole thesis is recapitulated. Um, so you, you recap recapitulate your kind of whole thesis. And then you go plus one step more. Try to condense and tease out huh, the main argument of your thesis. What is the main argument? What is the takeaway message? What are you trying to tell to the world, as I said during the abstract? The main kind of the core. The ember in the nectar. That's conclusion. One part. Second, in the conclusion, you can have a section. Okay, you can actually call it, you don't have to necessarily call it conclusion. You can also call it, let's say, clues for future research. You give some indication of further research. Nobody is expecting that by one research you will solve all problem in that subject or on that theme. Nobody is expecting. So you have done your part. You have made a bit of contribution to the body of broader body of knowledge. But in doing so, in the process, in the course of your research, you might have gained some ideas about interesting future directions that you, know, you have not been able to try in your research, but others can do. Okay. So conclusion can have two parts. Okay, This is what we say just for the sake of understanding. You don't necessarily have to call it conclusion. You can call it clues on future research or whatever. Okay. Further research, etc. So two parts. One is conclusion as Decapitulation and summary of the main arguments. That's one part. Second part, clues on future research. That's conclusion. Let's come to recommendations. Recommendations must follow your discussion, findings and discussion. Now, remember. Three important points about recommendation. Three. Number one. If you have not discussed the issue, the subject, the matter, in your discussion or finding section, you cannot recommend. Even if your recommendation is otherwise valid, even if your recommendation is okay on its own merit, not acceptable. 
unless you have created the context to make that recommendation in the results and discussion part. So if the situation is not explained here, you cannot recommend here, simply. Okay, so again, let's do it again. So in other words, recommendation is linked to results and discussion. You create the context here, and then you recommend here. No context here, no recommendation. Finish. Number two. Recommendations must be implementable. This is where many of us get carried away. Many of us get carried away. We feel we have produced this thesis. So much of effort, huh? blood and sweat has gone into it. So now let us change the world and you produce a 20 page recommendation. I say, sit down, my friend. Don't fly high. Resist this temptation of getting overwhelmed, an exaggerated sense of your thesis and yourself. Recommendations, keep them precise to the point, implementable. Don't use terms like an overhauling of the system of financial management of UM is required. The spirit is well taken, and it may be true that you actually need serious reform of the financial system, but it makes a lousy, worthless recommendation. Unless, of course, you can say, okay, here, in this budgetary process, in step three, this intervention is required. And in step seven, that intervention is not required in the financial management budgetary process of UM. It is a recommendation. Precise to the point, implementable. If one is actually trying to implement and act on your recommendation, if anybody picks up your recommendation and actually want to, wants to do something with this, there has to be enough meat in your recommendation huh, to be able to get implemented. No sweeping comments. No exaggerated comments. Change the world. Let the poets do it. You are a researcher. Focus on specifics. Some journals, rarely, have actually told me you know, I feel very uncomfortable to talk about messages. Forgive me for that. Just examples I have to give. There was a special issue that we were editing for a for a an Oxford journal. And in the editorial board meeting, there was a suggestion. And if I mention that name, many of you will actually know this person. The guru. I was the guest editor for that issue. And he actually told me. And we actually had a discussion about five, six minutes. Again, okay, 
in a, in a London pub over in a very informal meeting, said that let's take out all the recommendations. After screening, I think 17 submissions were there. I think we ultimately seven made it through the review process. And uh, still, we were kind of, in terms of volume, we are uh, slightly over the pages. So we needed to do a bit of a further streaming. And one suggestion that this big name gave me was to take out all the recommendations. So remember, if you don't have something concrete to suggest, recommendation is not a must. It is not mandatory that you have to give recommendations and change the world. You are not Superman or women. Neither Superman nor Wonder Women. So act like a practicing researcher. And if you feel you don't have enough meat to make a implementable recommendation, you can simply say that it's not a recommendation. You need further research and give some proofs of further research. That's it. Done. If you recommend something, as I said, must be contextualized in your results and discussion section. So let me just. Yep. OK. So yeah, time was OK. Let me just uh, in just five to seven minutes. I hope I'm not bugging you too much. So let me just uh, put you. I've talked about methodology. Always remember methods and logos. Methodology will require a narration of the methods used. Why? What is the purpose? Always remember what is the purpose? The purpose is you are not telling your fellow researchers, look, this is how I have done my research. This is how I have rolled out my research project. If you want to follow and take some lead on it, here are the details. That's methods. That's the purpose of giving a method methodological description. And then you give the logos, the justification, the rationale for choosing the method. You bring in the whole philosophical discussion if you want. At a PhD, that is actually expected. And one of the things that I liked about your department is that they actually put a serious emphasis on the overall methodological contents in your MDS, especially, course, curricula. And I'm happy with that. So results and discussion. You can also call it findings and analysis. So don't get bogged down on terms. The fundamental point is simple. Results are the results, the outcome of your research. So you have applied some methods. You have applied, for example, interview. OK? And there is a proceedings coming out of the interview. That's your finding. Okay. You have done an FGD and you have a record of the FGD. That's your finding. So, results or findings are the outcome of the application of your methods. This is what I have found in my research. By using the method that I have explained in the methodology. 
corresponding to my research objectives as I explained in the objective section or in the introduction. Finish. That's the result. In the result and findings, you don't talk about others. In the results and findings, you don't bring in literature. You concentrate only on what your research has generated. In other words, outcome of the application of your methods. That's the result. Discussion or analysis is the interpretation of the results. Making sense of what you have found. Interpretation of what you have found. Making sense of it. That's where you again bring in the literature. That's where whatever you have done in the literature review section, okay, you can bring in. For example, you can say, this finding of mine is similar to Davidson 2009. Davidson observed a similar situation in Vietnam. What are you doing? You are corroborating your idea, your findings, drawing support from another researcher, Davidson, 2009, in the context of another country. So you can bring in other people's views in the discussion and analysis section. You can elaborate okay, your ideas. You can bring positive and negative arguments. All are allowed by way of elucidation. That's the term which underlies discussion or analysis, however you want to call it. Elucidation. E-L-U-C-I. That is the whole purpose of discussion or analysis. You try to elucidate So you try to open up different fronts. It's like blooming a flower. Huh? But then the challenge is in the conclusion, you have to bring it back again. That's the challenge. So okay, so let's say. Uh, you have the results. Okay, so you, you have the results. You have the results here. In the discussion, you are now opening up different dimensions of the result. Okay, you can go to any leg. Okay, for example, from one dimension, you can have sub strands coming out. Okay, so this is what we say elucidation. Opening up, opening up, opening up different fronts, okay, different branches, okay. But remember, this is your core. This is what you have actually found, okay. That's your core, okay. And now these are all your elucidations, okay. That's the discussion and analysis. The challenge is if you leave it like that, then you are confusing your readers. Readers might go, one reader might be here, for example, okay? And he really doesn't know how to come back here, okay? He's kind of lost. So at the conclusion, that is a big challenge if you're elucidating, especially in the case of PhD, because people are always under pressure, okay? They really try to open up all sorts of forms, okay? Because they are always thinking in terms of, Am I doing it right? 
Am I doing it enough? Is this good enough for a PhD? Do I get at least two articles published in, you know, all sorts of pressure. So they try to... The big challenge is, if you do that, you have to then come back again. You have to come back again, maintain a precise focus during completion. That is the biggest challenge. So here, corresponding to your results and discussion, okay, you have to have, again, a conclusion. That's your conclusion, okay? So again, a conclusion. To get back to the conclusion, this is the biggest challenge. So you need to then, okay, bring all them, all the strands back in to one point, okay? Help the reader to identify the path back. Okay, back, bring back, bring back, bring back all to one point again. That is the last section in your analytical chapter. You bring all the strengths back in one point. I'm not saying this is easily done. This is surely difficult to do. Yes, it is difficult. Okay, and do I do it all the time right? No, I do it 70% right, but 30% I still make big mistakes. Not just mistakes, big, big blunders. Okay, and that's the reason I get rejected. I say here, yeah, routine. Then, this is where you need help, especially for research students. You need help your, from your supervisor. So you get it back and then you distill this idea back into your conclusion. So this is the result. And this is the discussion, the whole gamut of elaboration is the discussion. And this is the conclusion. Okay, I think I've said enough, my friend. I have said enough. Okay, so discard, let's just go back. There's no point in killing you. Good, okay, so move on then. Um, so let me stop sharing. Or uh, maybe, oh, let me stop sharing. Yeah, so we've got, um, we're actually past 10 minutes. Okay, so anyway, let's, uh, if you, have time? I can. I can. I think we can do another ten minutes. Yeah, please. Uh, you can take. Uh, in fact, um, another ten minutes, uh, Prof. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. If, if anybody has any um, question, this is my landing time. Okay, I'm done. Thank you, uh, Prof. Vashkar, for this uh, opportunity. And thank you, my friends, for being with so, me. So, so you you finish your? Uh... Yeah, yeah, I'm finished. Done. Okay. Let me open the floor. Uh, before that, uh, let me briefly make uh, some observation. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Niyas, for your sharing your experience, uh, valuable tips uh, on writing research report. Um, I have seen myself, uh, I, I think examined over 20 PhD theses and maybe 150 master theses. And I'm an editor in chief of uh, African Journal of Science, Technology, Innovation, Development. I got frustrated when I read these abstracts written by when people submit whether thesis or whether they submit journal articles. In fact, I had to rewrite the guidelines for authors on how to write abstract recently. And give a detailed instruction uh, on how to write uh, abstract uh, in the website. So I think what you said about, uh, it is an art itself, writing an abstract, writing conclusion, writing introduction. Most people definitely they read these three things before they read rest. So I think you are, uh, you know, observations and tips are very valuable in that sense. Only one issue I want to clarify with you. 
your comments on recommendations you see we are in social sciences and for example i'm running a policy journal and it's you said it's not mandatory for you to write recommendations but we are all driven by impact research nowadays any funding is tied to what kind of social economic impact your research is creating so that implies that your research meant to you know produce some kind of policy uh, recommendations at the end and some relevance to practice so i, I would say it may be the best one of the best practices to follow uh, providing recommendations what's your thought on it So I agree, Professor. I was just trying to quickly point out the point I was trying to make is that making recommendations as specific as possible to the extent. Now, I'm not saying at all that this is, uh, you know, we, we could do without recommendations. In that particular example that we gave, we are thinking from a journal publication point of view uh, that mm -hmm. if recommendations were not um, clear enough, substantive enough, then better not to include. But you are absolutely right. We if you're doing, for example, a policy research and not coming out with at least one or two concrete ideas, uh, then the donors or the sponsors may find it incomplete. Yes, you're right. Agree. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Sonia, please, uh, could, could you go through the questions you uh, collected from audience? Hi, hi, Prof. Uh, got it, Dr. Bas. Uh, hi, Prof. Nyas. Hello. If I may just read um, the questions which I've, I've compiled through the chat box. Yeah. And I myself have one, if you don't mind. Uh, but I'll let you answer the questions from the audiences first. The first question is by Lee Zen. What are the differences between abstract and introduction in a report? Okay. The second question. Is that sufficient if I get materials from Google Scholar for my for my research, as it encompasses all journal, whether index or non-index? Perhaps I'll give you two questions first, Prof, and I'll read the other two. Yeah. Um. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanya. Thank you, Lizen, for that um, useful question. Um. Introduction basically is where you set out the context of the problem that you are researching, especially in the social sciences. Here you also bring in a bit of the rationale and justification points. Although you might actually have a separate section, especially when you're doing a PhD, on justification. But in the introduction, basically you're setting the scene. Whereas in the abstract, as I said, you need to have five items. So I'm not going to repeat that just for the sake of time. One of the items is what you cover in the introduction. The problem setting plus a bit of justification. So introduction, if you like, a very summarized version of the introduction would be one fifth of your abstract. So that will be one point out of five items in your abstract. So that's your first uh, answer remember my friends you know i know very little and this is just my way of handling things okay so that's my tips especially that has worked for my life or for my students so i'm not at all claiming that you have to these are standardized practices you, you can just pick and choose and follow that's what you have to have to discuss with your supervisors etc good the second point um, was that is google scholar good enough Okay, Google Scholar, if you ask hardcore academics, especially the high flung ones, they might feel Google Scholar doesn't have the, the gravity of a search engine. Okay. To me, Google Scholar is okay. Fine. But that's to me. Google Scholar, as you have said, it also includes sometimes, let's say, 
non-peer reviewed materials. So thereby the, thereby the critics would say that you are compromising the quality of the material included in Google Drive, uh, in Google Scholar. As an initial point to get going, okay, I would say Google Scholar is good. I'm happy with it. In any case, this literature review, you need to consult and develop your own style. I, for example, I would never take more than 10 materials in one go. Because, okay, I've got a very limited brain, okay, and I never would be able to absorb more than 10 materials at a time. Okay, so my limit is just 10 in one go, and then the next chunk. Okay, even for PhDs, okay, my initial reading, depending on the subject, of course, my initial reading would be about 50. That would be my suggestion to my students. So I would say as a good beginning point, Google Scholar is fine by me. Okay. Thank you, Prof. I'll just read out the other other three questions uh, by Li Ling. Um, so she is in the field of social sciences and humanities. Her study is primarily qualitative in nature. Now her question is, how would you advise students to deal with examiners' questions with regards to reliability and validity of qualitative research study? And she also says that she often finds different arguments on establishing a theoretical framework and a conceptual framework for her research study. In your opinion, how are they different in application? Okay, the first point is these are always relative. That's where you actually need your supervisor's support. Nobody can tell you, nobody, nobody can tell you that this is an exhaustive method. Every method by definition is imperfect. Let's get it right up front. Every method by definition is imperfect. So whenever you are choosing a method, whatever method, interview, FGD, whatever, whenever you are choosing a method, okay, you need a logos. That's the point. So validity, reliability questions are very typical, especially for research degrees. You need to have an, you know, as I said, Davis advocate argument with your supervisor. Let him ask hard questions. Remember BBC's hard talk? Okay, do that. Do a bit of a mock practice of it. Okay, that will help. Now, one simple way to handle this, some of these kind of criticism is simply to say that I have done enough effort to do the triangulation. So I haven't depended, for example, on a particular method over well So that's one idea. We don't have time to get into the long details of it, but just to summarize, there will always be questions about methods because methods are not perfect. And every researcher need to, needs to justify and come out with his or her explanations. Methodological pluralism, that's the term we use technically. Methodological pluralism, okay, is a good way to handle this. So when you talk about triangulation, we also talk about that I have an dependent on, dependent on a particular method. So that's one way of handling this. The other question which you asked um, about, well, today's discussion broadly, we actually focus on broad social sciences. So you and I, we are all kind of at the same level. So um, you talked about... Um, the difference between theoretical and conceptual yeah, framework. Yeah. See, a conceptual framework is also coming from theories. That's where you begin. 
The purpose of a conceptual framework is this. This, this is the purpose. You create a lens. You create an, a spectacle okay, to look onto your research. So this is the analytical frame you are putting in to see your research problem. It helps you to organize your thoughts. It helps you to give you a clear focus. Okay? So when you're talking about, I'm going to see inequality in Malaysia's slums. Okay? Kuala Lumpur slums. There are so many dimensions of inequality you can look at. Even inequality of mental deprivation. There are so many dimensions, so many issues that you can think of. So you do your theoretical overview, review of literature, to help you identify the themes and focal areas, which can then be put into a class, a spectacle, that will help you to understand that particular problem or phenomenon, inequality in slums in Kuala Lumpur. Okay? So that will help you, for example, if you choose five dimensions, then you put together this five dimension in an articulated analytical framework. By definition, it is a framework, it is a lens which you use for analysis. This is the lens through which you see. Rather than looking at everything and you get completely overwhelmed, because there are so many things to look at, you try to boil this down into five items, four items, three items. Where? From where? What is the source? Theory. So they are complementary. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Um, okay, she just has one more question, and if you don't mind, I would like to fit in mine. Um, her, her, quest, her last question would be, I believe she's talking about the discussion uh, subsection of the, the paper. Uh, do you mean we have to have a mini co uh, conclusion or a summary after each discussion point before going into the big conclusion? Now, that's her question. Now, on my question, Prof, um, as a relatively um, young researcher myself, um, I just have a, a question regarding uh, journal submission fee. So when we write a, a, a paper, and if you realize big journals or good journals, even some reliable Scopus journals are starting to impose submission fee. And for those of us in developing country, those fees can be quite hefty, particularly for students that need to publish before um, graduation. Um, now, how, how would you recommend um, uh, or how, how can we ass assess that our paper is of a particular quality before we send the paper in, pay the submission fee, and then get a desk, desk rejection later because that's quite um, uh, demotivating, especially for some students who are doing single country analysis. Um, that, so that's my question, Prof. I hope you can give us your, your, your best advice. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Dr. Sonia. That's a, that's a very practical query that you have. And uh, let's, let's begin with business plan. That's also very important. Articulation is very important, my friends. Articulation. Very, very important. So do whatever you can to make sure that you have a very strong structured, articulated thesis. The flow of logic is running clearly and smoothly. You have to ensure that. The suggestion that you have given later is actually good. If you want to have a summary at the end of every chapter, good, that. it would mean sometimes a bit of repeat between the chapters, okay, okay. If it helps the reader to see the clear flow of logic, okay, you can do chapter-wise summary, 
and then have a broad recapitulation okay in the final chapter summarizing the whole thesis but as i said a bit threshing out teasing out at the end of that summary your final argument what is the main message the take away so yes i'm happy uh, that you have given this it's actually a good suggestion from your side you can go by chapters and then do a summary okay in the summary maybe there will be some repetition because you have already done some chapter summary in the main summary in the main conclusion there may be some repetition i say okay as long as it serves the purpose of beta articulation okay fine and then towards the end give your main message but so next point unfortunately this is a very sad reality this is the reason i told right at the beginning okay, without any diplomacy whatsoever that publication business okay has its spikes some of it i don't like and you don't like as well although we see on both the sides as researcher and also on this publisher the reality is okay, special this has happened over the last 10 15 years with the growing pressure to publish or perish this is the market response the market responding to an academic cause in a commercial manner that is what you are talking about so i don't have a clear answer for this um some kind of rule of thumb that i have found useful see whether you had the article that you have developed see whether you have a clear message that actually very much falls within the journal scope but in the last 3 4 years or so that you haven't seen that particular message in any of the published journals it sounds big it's not very difficult so in one particular journal in your specific kind of field you might actually find one publication in a year or so so you're talking about four five publications and see if there is a clear niche in your work that's one Okay. Secondly, try out more than one outlet right at the beginning. Start thinking about it. What we do now, and this is a common practice now in any So Tobas, I think his line is uh, a bit it's frozen or uh, terminated. Yeah. Yeah. Um. We we'll just give him some time. Yes. Yes. Let's and then we can open the floor to the the rest of the participants. Yes. 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 Please okay. do. All right. Yeah. Dr. Mehdi, Dr. Mehdi, can you please uh, contact him over the phone and find out? Yeah, he might be still answering my question. Yeah, yeah, that's the reason I'm asking him to contact the phone. Dr. Mehdi, can you let's hear what? Uh, he's not here. No, he's here. Okay. Let me just. Sonia, do you have his uh, phone contact? Uh, not Prof Nias, but um, uh, I think Mehdi has it. Uh, okay. Let me let me let me just call Dr. Mehdi. Yeah.
uh, Dr. Bas, he sent me an email. He yeah. said he has lost connection. Uh, okay. He said give him a few minutes to come back in. All right, no problem. Let's okay. wait. All right. Okay, yeah. So in the meantime, uh, shall we find out, you know, how useful the webinar for uh, those who are listening to him? Okay, thank you, Ganesh. Thank you, Liling. Thank you for your feedback. Yeah, because uh, it, it looks a uh, lot of people are interested. I, at one point, I saw over 80 people on the <clears throat> uh, participating in the event. Uh, it looks very uh, kind of popular for a lot of different audience. Uh, maybe we will do it again. Uh, of course, it, it would have been useful if he had used examples. When he said uh, three things you have to keep in mind when you are writing a title. Yes, Prof. Niyas, you are back. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I apologize for this, uh, but I have to actually finish. Uh, Professor Niyas is back. Line is very Hi, Prof. Can you now, hear us? Uh, electricity failure. Um, so we'll see. But anyway, so let's. Uh, I think I answered. Um, okay. It's very practical query. Uh, so what I was trying to, yes. the last point I was trying to make is that typically we try to add some additional money now into the projects to try out different outlets. So public fees typically are now included in the, in the, in the projects. It's a very standard practice. But this is where you know I really have got great reservation for this. But unfortunately, it cannot help. Thank you, Dr. Nevada, for raising a very practical Okay. The floor for others to, yeah, yeah. Yeah, go on, sorry. Perhaps we can think about three more questions. Yeah, yeah. if I can request to um, finish by, uh, let's say, another uh, 10 minutes at, at max. Please. Uh, Dr. Sonia, some students, they suggested uh, to circulate the recordings of this webinar today. Maybe you can arrange it later. Yes, yes. yes. So I, will, I will send are, the recordings of it. Hmm. If there are no additional questions, uh, shall we bring this session to a close? Okay. Uh, I think I would like to thank, uh, first of all, Professor Yas Khan for his wonderful and very informative and useful presentation for both, uh, which can benefit both uh, researchers who have been doing research for many years and also our students. Uh, thank you, Professor Yas. And I would like to thank all the participants. And uh, once again, I want to apologize for the technical glitch we had at the beginning and the end. Uh, that's unavoidable sometime. It's not in our control. Thank you again for everyone who attended this webinar today. And uh, I will bring this uh, session to a close now. Thank you. Thank you, thank Professor. You, yeah. Yeah, can, I, yeah, can I just say thank you to all of you and uh, for organizing this? Uh, a short notice, thank you, 
So, someone I hear someone want to say something. Uh, so oh. feel free to communicate. Thank you very much for everything. Okay, thank you. Asked. Thank you, Professor Nias. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you, you all. Much. Thank you very much. Let's yeah. uh, bring this to an end. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.